Good morning, team St. Elizabeth. So I hope the world finds you well this morning. This is the next in a series of looking at worship, and a reading and a short reflection to be had in conjunction with our communion service for the service that will take place on 17th of May. So let's begin with our reading. The reading is taken from Acts chapter 17, verses 22 to 31. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar to this with this inscription, to an unknown God. Now what you worship is something unknown, I am going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth, and does not live in temples built by hands. And he is not served by human hands, as if he needed anything, because he himself gives all life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all nations, that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he determined the times set for them and the exact places where they should live. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set up a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. Who or what do you worship? Who or what do you give worth to? This reading from Acts finds Paul, an early church leader, walking around Athens, taking in the sights. He is at the Areopagus, a major meeting place near a rock called by the same name, where magistrates met to give judgments on cases brought before them. It was a busy place with people milling around, listening, talking, seeking advice. So Paul adds to the mix. He shouts and people stop to listen. Good city! I see you are religious. I even found an altar to an unknown God. Well, I want to tell you that God is knowable. He doesn't need temples. After all, he's bigger than that. He has created us. He's placed us all in certain places at certain times with a view to knowing him. Paul is saying that central to living life is the opportunity to know God. Knowing God and therefore to worship God is the reason for life itself. And that is a massive claim to make. Yet if God is who he says he is, our creator, then there can really be no other way. To hold such a view is to completely turn on its head a dominant idea of Western society today, which is that God doesn't exist. But here... Paul is saying that our ability to know and to be known by God is really what life is for, and he's very knowable. To push the argument forwards, to know God and to worship him is the most significant thing we can do in life. Our worship becomes that important. Our society has turned things on its head big time. I've mentioned before the turn to the self, the idea that our inner self is the most important thing there is. In order to keep ourselves feeling on an even keel, 
we need to resource the inner self in different ways. Now, we do need to do that even if we are worshipping God. But the turn to the self emphasises this over worshipping God. In other words, as we worship, rather than allowing our emotional energy to be directed beyond ourselves towards God, our focus is on maintaining an inner emotional balance within ourselves by needing and wanting to be calm and centred. For so many, this has replaced what Paul identifies as the central need for us in life, to worship God. Now, if that need to recognise who God is and to worship is so central to life, and if it isn't happening as much as it once was, then that is sadly only going to be to the detriment of humanity. And it can be no surprise that there is such restlessness in society. And that was before the, pan the pandemic began. It is interesting that in so many churches, the experience at this time has been there's been a good number of people looking in at what we do from the edges. The internet does in this way provide a helpful anonymity which can help people to check out what Christian spirituality has to offer. For some there's been a fresh revelation that the turn to the self has been detrimental to us. There is more to know. Sadly I am sure that the pandemic will deeply challenge some people's Christian belief but I imagine, I hope, that it will also help others to find out more about God who is knowable, who Paul says we need to know to make more sense of what life itself is all about. So connecting with God in worship is about finding our centre in life. In fact Paul emphasises that if we don't connect with God then we find ourselves being judged by God. Maybe, just maybe, Part of that judgment is about experience, that sense of restlessness, which so many in the West feel. And the antidote to that restlessness is to worship God. You'll have to work out what you feel about that for yourselves. I've mentioned the turn to the self, but this passage raises other questions too. Paul noticed that there were many objects of worship for the Athenians to spend time at, Okay, in our society we will not find little temples or shrines dotted about the place for you to stop and ponder at, but people do still offer worship to different things. A simple way of working out where your emotional and worshipful energy is being directed is, bluntly, to look at your bank balance. We do purchase stuff emotionally, clothing, big ticket items, technology, nothing wrong with that. Uh, and with the recession looming, no doubt we will be encouraged to spend as much as we can. But actually, where we spend our man money says a lot about what we hold as being worthy, what we hold to be sacred, what we give our worth to. Yes, there is a cheap plug here to think about giving to the church for it to flourish as much as it is able in these challenging times. Yet, if all your spare income goes towards particular items, what does that help to reveal about your values and what you find to be of worth to us? So this passage encourages us to think about what the purpose of life itself is about. Paul argues that life is our opportunity to know God. Secondly, the passage can challenge us to ask ourselves about what we give our worth, our worship to. In Paul's eyes, life itself is about knowing, about worshipping God, turning our emotional energy towards God and giving him worth helps us to find our own place in life. So who or what do you ultimately give your worth to? Who or what do you worship? Only you can answer that, but to draw on Paul's arguments here. To worship God brings fresh, fresh meaning to life itself. As he notes, the how we answer that question 
will have eternal consequences. Worship is a life-giving activity. It is that serious a subject indeed.